because there are certain things that define you as close to God or not. And those are the marks of a spiritual person. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm reminded, if we can go ahead and put that first screen up there, Wayne, I'm reminded of, of uh, how we, we mark people today. And uh, just this last week, uh, Donald Sterling, the owner of the L.A. Clippers, made some comments in the privacy of his own home, which were racist in nature. But I've, I've been amazed at how overwhelmingly crushing the response has been. Now, you can't run a, a basketball franchise in the NBA and, and, not, and, and be a racist because it's made up largely of minorities. And, uh, but I have been amazed at how everybody wants to jump on board and just label immediately and crush the man off the face of the earth. That man shouldn't own a basketball team, but where's the, where's the, the, uh, the balanced approach to it? In America, we are anxious to label everybody. You know, it's, 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 the, way, it's the way we operate in this country. And I thought to myself, we live in a day when it's easier to live when you feel like you know who everybody is. But you know, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to realize that God says we are all one. Amen. And that's the way we need to operate. Right. This, this concept of, of labeling people or one race against another race, that's not of God, ever. That's right. That's right. Because we all come from the same mother and father. You go back far enough and Adam is my grandpa and Eve is my grandma. It's the same with you, Rich. Same with you, Travis. You go back far enough, we got the same mommy and we got the same dad. And that's the way God wants it. He wants us to see it that way. But uh, in, in the Old West, I, I was watching a little bit this week, and, uh, and back when, when uh, there was a territory that was like 400 mile, square miles and it was called Comanchero, or Comanche territory. And uh, the Comanches ruled with the scalp and the spear and the tomahawk, and you went through there, and, and you went through there risking your hair all the way. But they started the Chisholm Trail. With, with, it was a part of the Chisholm Trail birth, and, and they, would, they, they would take these cattle, and, and uh, there were so many cattle after the Civil War because there was nobody taking care of them during the Civil War. And after the Civil War, they didn't know whose cattle belonged to who, and there wasn't fences, and, and everything was just wide open. And, and they would came up with the concept that we're going to brand these cattle. And when I brand these cattle, I know that if I see the lazy L, that belongs to farmer so-and-so, rancher so-and-so. And I know if I see the circle C, that belongs to somebody else, and that way 
the cattle were marked and you knew who they were. But let me say this much. People know before very long who belongs to God. And you know, it doesn't take long for people to know if you don't belong to the Lord either. They can figure that out pretty quickly. You know, you don't have to be spiritual to, have, to develop a general idea of those that either are or are not. Because every one of us have the image of God stamped on us. And we can deny God and, and, and we can say all kinds of crazy things. But the truth is, there still are no atheists in foxholes. People, when they get, when the crunch comes and when the, when the dark times come, even atheists have been known to pray. They may not know who they're praying to. I remember hearing about one atheist who was out with a Christian friend and they were out and the atheist just looked at the beautiful vista they were viewing and he said, you know, what's amazing, he said, is I'm just, I just feel so thankful for what I'm looking at. And the Christian looked at him and said, well, who are you going to thank? Didn't want to thank God, but something in his heart said, I just want to thank someone. I want to thank the Creator, but he wouldn't obviously acknowledge that. You, as you serve the Lord, you will develop the marks of a spiritual person in your life. And we're not going to cover it extensively, obviously, in this message. But in Galatians 6.17, the Apostle Paul, and I want to look at his life a little bit this morning. He said, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Uh, he didn't say, he could have said, I've got a scar here, and, and I, I've got a whiplash here, and, and I, I've got contusions here. He said, these are the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know, when I think of Jacob, and how he uh, started his life, and... and uh, he deceived his father and he took his brother's birthright and he went to his uncle Laban and he lived there for many years trying to buy wives and building wealth. And the time came when he had to leave his father-in-law's house. And then his father-in-law Laban heard that his idols were stolen and he came with, with his servants and he was going to kill Jacob. He was going to attack Jacob because he stole his gods and Jacob talked his way out of that, and then Jacob went on his way again, and then he heard some more news. It was even worse that his brother Esau was going to come with 400 men, and he was going to take out Jacob for good. And then began that process of Jacob becoming a marked man. Because the first thing he did, and we're not going to preach from that passage, but the first thing he did was he sent a batch. There might have been a few lame animals in this batch, there might have been a servant or two that was a bit of a troublemaker. And he said, I'm going to send him them on ahead as a gift to my brother Esau. But then he thought about it again and he said, you know, that might not be enough. And so he sent another batch of animals and goods and servants. And he sent them on ahead. And then he began to send family members. But he saved those precious things for last. And finally he had to send his loving son and his wife Rachel. And he had to send them on with the last bit. And he was left all by himself. Do you know that I have found in my own life that God has to get us alone away from our treasures and the things we love the most before we will allow Him to mark us for life. That's what God... You, you know, what it is, is the things we have in this world, they have a tendency to distract us from becoming all that God has intended for us to be. And you know, it, it, it's so much fun to just protect ourselves and, and to gather things around ourselves so that we can say, this is my mark. But God has a way of removing those things sometimes and clearing the path until there's nothing between us and the angel of the Lord as it was with Jacob. And then God can wrestle with us. Jacob didn't, didn't have anything else left but himself. Just Jacob. You know, it's amazing what we'll give up to protect ourselves sometimes. Even as Christians. Oh Lord, I don't mind giving this up as long as you don't ask for that. But the Lord says, just keep sending the treasures ahead. Because you and I have a WWF match. GWF, God Wrestling Federation. That's what we'll call it that. <laughs> but you know what? There's a lot of people that 
They don't learn their lesson until they're all alone. Jacob was that way. Jacob was a man who was so conniving and so good at getting it his way and so good at, at deceiving and supplanting and doing all those things that God said, you know, I'm going to have to get you to the point where you've got nothing before you will listen to me and you will learn what I'm really trying to teach you, son. Now, did God not love Jacob? No. God actually loved him so much that he was everything Jacob gave up was an act of God's mercy. Because God had a plan to mark Jacob and change his nature and give him a place in history. God's history. Let me just, let me just before we get into this message and look at the Apostle Paul and some of the marks that he had. Let me ask you this question. What would happen if you would really let God mark you for life? I'm talking not just a commitment to this church or go to work and say, I'm a Christian now. But I mean, if you would let God have you, everything about you, what could God do with you? You know, I believe God has a plan. God has a plan for everybody in this building. And I believe in my heart that most Christians never fulfill in America all that God has for them because they surround themselves with things that keep God from getting their attention long enough to mark them for life. But when someone does, there's a transformation that takes place. There's a usability that becomes visible and becomes possible that was never dreamed of before. Amen. When I talk about sanctification, here's one of the ways I describe it. When we get saved, we give God all of our trash. Here's my lust, and here's my theft, and here's my foul language, and here's all my bad habits, and here's all the nastiness in my life. And you know what God does? He takes it and He says, Thank you, my child. Give me your trash. You know of anybody else that would take our trash? I don't know of anybody else. But God does. Can I hear a praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. God takes every bit of my trash Amen. and He casts it into the sea of His forgetfulness to be remembered against me no more. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. There are days when God is a trash man. And he takes it all and he throws it away. It doesn't even leave any environmental hazards from it. It's in the sea of God's forgetfulness. But you know what sanctification, you know what the word sanctify means? It means to set apart for a holy purpose. That's what sanctify is. And you know in the Bible, we find people who were set apart. In the Old Testament, you'll read it. It said they had to sanctify themselves. They had to do ceremonial cleansing and washing and, and, and not touch certain things and not eat other things or not cut their hair if they took a Nazarite vow <clears throat> because they were wholly separated unto the Lord. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The only way that the American culture is going to experience a revival is not if they straighten up because sinners ain't going to straighten up. They're not going to solve the problems. Christianity will solve the problems. Amen? Amen. It's if the church straightens up. It's if the church allows itself to be marked as a man or a woman who belongs 100% to God. Amen. And that's what happened to Jacob. Jacob. Jacob said, Lord, after they'd wrestled all night long. Now, if you've ever wrestled, Travis, I know you've wrestled, and you wrestle for a couple of minutes, and that's exhausting, especially when you get to grapple. I mean, I'd much rather box somebody than wrestle. I mean, man, it takes, you got muscle on muscle, and it's like two, two balls of sinew just in a big tussle, and man, it just wears you down. Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night. You know, sometimes God comes and He gets a hold of us, and we wrestle with Him for about 30 seconds, and they say, Lord, I can't take that. I want to go back and pick up some more of my stuff. But Jacob knew that his life was over. In his mind, Esau's coming. He's going to kill me. He's taking all my wives and all my kids and all my money and all my sheep and my flocks. He's got it. It was all he had left. 
And so he wasn't going to let go of that angel of the Lord, which most theologians believe was the pre-incarnate Christ. He wasn't going to let go of him. And as it became morning, the angel of the Lord said, let me go, for morning is coming. And then Jacob said the magic words. He said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. You know, God wants to get us in a place that He can make us so desperate for His blessing. And when we become more desperate for God's blessing than we do for all the stuff here in the world, and our family, and our cars, and our money, and our junk, when we get more desperate for God than we do for that stuff, we will be marked. That's when we receive the marks of a spiritual person. And the Lord, first thing He did was He said, what is your nature? Because He asked Him, what is your name? And in the Old Testament, your name meant something. I mean, you know, we name people everything today. We name them after soap commercials. We name them after Star Wars characters. But you know, in the Old Testament, when you received a name, it had to do with your character. And you know what the name Jacob means? It means deceiver, supplanter, heel grabber. Because when he and Esau were born, Esau was coming out first and out came the next hand and grabbed Esau's heel. It was highly symbolic of what was going to happen. And you know, my friends, we need to understand that when God begins to deal with our nature, He's not dealing with our trash anymore. He wants our treasures. He wants those things that He can take and refine and purify what I discovered in my life is the things in myself that I hold in my hand, they putrefy. If I hang on to it and don't give it to God, I'll spoil it with my selfishness. And it'll come around to bite me. But whatever is painful that I say, God, you can have this treasure. Yes, I'll use it for you. I found that God purifies it and He gives it back. He doesn't just take it away from me. You know, if God gave you the ability to do something for Him, He doesn't just want to take it away from you, but He does want you to give it to Him. So He can purify it and then give it back. And that's what happened. He said, Jacob, what is your name? My name is Deceiver. My name is Supplanter. My name is Heel Grabber. My name is Liar. And God said this. He said, now I'm going to give you a new name. Israel, because you have prevailed with both man and with God. You know what happens when God changes us and marks us, changes our nature? You know what happens? He gives us effective ministry with man because we are in favor with God. If you try to minister with a carnal mindset, you may accomplish a few things, but you won't accomplish God's best plan. The only way to accomplish God's best plan is to allow Him to mark you. Now some would say, well, wasn't it enough that God changed His name? God gave Jacob this new name? No. There had to be a mark that the world could see that Jacob had wrestled with God. And you know, there are things that happen in our lives when we give everything to God that those around us can see very clearly. He touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh. And that's where your strength is and your thighs, especially when you're wrestling. And he went lame. It shrank. And he didn't have the strength in that muscle. And then the angel of the Lord went away from him. And from that day on, Jacob walked with a limp. But it wasn't just some tragedy that took place. It was a mark that God had put on him. And you know what, my friends? God wants to mark every one of us. When the world sees you, how do they know you? Do they know you as God's man, as God's woman? Or do they know you as someone who has a church affiliation? Or someone who just says, I'm a Christian? You know, when it came to the Apostle Paul's life, he had some things about him which marked him as a spiritual man. First thing I want you to notice, what marks did Paul have? is that he had the mark of devo total devotion to a task. In 2 Timothy 4.7, he made this statement as he was writing this letter in prison to, to Timothy 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You know, one of the things that, that helps us when, when we understand we have this mark of total devotion to a task. You know, the reason the church is suffering all across the world today is because there are too many Christians that are not totally devoted to what God has called them to do in the church. We're suffering because of that. You know, it's so easy just to play around the edges and take what the church gives me and makes me feel better. But when it costs me something, then all of a sudden, God, I'm backing up on you. I'm backing up on you. You know, that's why there are Christian workers today who are burning out. Because there are other Christian workers who are not doing what God has called them to do. Because they're not totally marked and committed to God. Amen. This is what we need to understand. Paul had this mark of total devotion. First of all, he had a devotion to counting the cost because he said, I have fought the good fight. You know, we have to realize that we're not on a playground. We're on a battleground when we serve God. God doesn't set us on the swing set of His love and say, I'll see you when I come back. He stands us up and He gives us a shield and He gives us a sword, which is the Word. And He puts a helmet on us. And He shines our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And He puts the breastplate of righteousness on. He says, now be careful, be sober, be vigilant, for your enemy the devil is walking around like a roaring lion, looking whom he may devour. We are on a battleground. Amen. The Apostle Paul had a devotion to counting the cost. You know, the people who are marked by God are willing to pay what it costs to accept that mark. And to accept the brand of the Lord Jesus Christ on their lives. We have a lot of people today that have a devotion to something else other than counting the cost for God. They count the cost for themselves too often, but they don't count the cost for what it takes to serve the Lord. But he also had a devotion to continue his calling because he said, I have finished the race. You know, he was referring to a specific race. Whenever... The Olympians go in for those races. They don't all run every race. They have a specific race. You have the long distance runners. You have the sprinters. You have the different lengths of races. And, and each one says, this is my race. This is what I'm good at. This is what I must train for. And I want to finish my race. I was talking to my sister recently. Kim Collingsworth, and they're, they're in the music business, and, and it's a business, but to them it's a ministry. And every Tuesday night they have a prayer meeting, which has gone on for years, and they, they call that the heartthrob of their ministry, the engine room of their ministry. They have Dr. Alan Brown from GBS comes over once a week, and he gives them a three-hour Bible study, and she, he's, he's just wonderful, and, and, and it's their church, it's where they grow up. And she said that uh, they received a phone call from the uh, television station that does Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. I don't watch Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. It's way too crude. And furthermore, I have absolutely no interest. What is that, A&E or something? One of, those, one of those programs. But they received a phone call. And these people are always out looking for new reality television shows. And they called Phil and they said, Phil, we're with this television program, this, this cable station, and, and we want to do a reality TV show on your family, and we're willing to give you a five-year contract. And we'll pay you $600,000 an episode. Talking about the end of your money problems. Kendrick, I've never seen that look on your face before, but that was amazing. <laughs> I didn't know Kendrick could be that emotional. <laughs> because we want to film a family who does gospel music. And Kim said, Phil came to her and she said, our mouths just hit the floor. Five years. You start adding up. It's just mind-boggling. And she said, we began to pray about it. And the first thing that came to our mind was, this is a wonderful way to get the message that there are good, godly Christian people who love the Lord and they're normal. Because television portrays Christian people as psychotic and crazy and immoral. But she said the more we prayed about it, 
She said, the Lord began to make it real to us. This is not your calling. I want you to finish the race that I have called you to run. And I want you to finish it well. Have I not met all your needs? Yes, Lord, you've met all of our needs. Am I not blessing you right now? Yes, Lord. I haven't given you this much money, but I have met all of your needs. You don't need to worry about money because I'm in charge of your finances. Do you want to put a cable television channel in charge of your finances? And she said, the more we thought about it, she said, we finally picked up the phone and with confidence called them back and said, thank you so much. We would love to have this opportunity. But she said, we told them this on the phone to the executives in Hollywood. The Lord has said, we need to stay focused upon our ministry and not get sidetracked by other things. And they turned it down. They had a devotion to continue their calling. The Apostle Paul had a devotion. He said, I have finished the race. When Kim and Phil come to the end of that ministry, it's not going to be, did we make all the money from the cable deal? It's going to be, did we finish the race that God put us in? And did we finish well? Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. He not only had a devotion to His calling, He had a devotion to cling to Christ because He said, I have kept the faith. The faith in what? The faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The faith in the One who died for me, who rose again, who gives me every strength I have today. I have kept the faith in Him. The Apostle Paul said in different places, that he was anxious to give up everything for the excellency of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he had done that. Paul had the mark of total devotion to a task. He also had the mark of humility because in Philippians 3 7, he said, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Folks, if you're giving up things for the church, it's not a good deal. If you're giving up things because your family wants you to, it's not a good deal. But if you're giving up things for Christ, it's the best deal you can make. Amen. And he was willing to lay aside everything he possessed in his previous life represented pride. Pride of possessions. He had all that Israel could offer when it came to possessions. Pride of position. He said, I was the Pharisee of a Pharisee. Pride of education. He had been, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He had been trained in the best Hebrew colleges. But all of that represented in his life was pride. And he said, I am letting it all go so that I can take the one who said, I am meek and lowly. Come and taste of me. He accepted humility. Do we have the mark of humility? When we are marked by the Lord Jesus Christ, humility becomes more and more prominent in our lives. Thirdly, he had the mark of suffering. In Romans 8, 16 and 17, he writes, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then we are heirs. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we what? Suffer with Him. That we may also be glorified together. We, we need to understand that when you really identify with Jesus Christ, you are in direct opposition to the spirit of the world. And you know, the spirit of the world many times is in the church too. And when you stand up and say, I'm going to get serious about God, there's Christians who will tell you to simmer down. You say...